Welcome to a new episode of Candid Conversation, and I am your host, Stephanie Fletas. And today we have a guest, Monica Bencomo. She is the author of Seven Habits of a Healthy Mom. And she has a, has a blog called MomsWearHeels.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to talk to her about motherhood, for those of you who are already um, parents or are thinking about it. Marriage, obviously, goes hand in hand and what it means to pursue your dreams, career, and balance it all out. <laughs> Woo! Welcome, Monica. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you, Stephanie. Me too. We've been planning this for a while, and we're finally getting around to it. Um, Monica yeah. and I connected when I was in Portugal. Yeah. I believe you were in Bali, I thought. Well, I was, Maybe yeah, Brown when we too. finally connected. You reached out yeah. to me when I was in Portugal and our schedules kind of were off. And then we finally connected when I was in Bali and we did an interview. So now it's my turn. And since then, you and I have kept in touch and I've been seeing everything that you're doing. Where do you live again? Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's right. Yeah. So I've been seeing that you've been doing a lot of stuff there. Um, a lot of TV appearances with your blog and your book. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's fun I love to talk I love TV but I really want to be the one like we said earlier asking the questions <laughs> but hopefully ultimately um I can do more more interviewing so we'll see how that goes that's good start by talking to you about um motherhood you're very young uh I am 27 years old right 28 oh you turned 28 already that's right because yeah. I'm turning 29 in like two weeks <laughs> Getting so old. <laughs> in two weeks? Uh, yeah, ne- yeah, in two weeks on the 27th. Okay, so what are you going to do for fun? Because I didn't plan my birthday, so I didn't have, like, this extravagant. I didn't do much. So what are you going to do to celebrate 29? I don't know. I always, for the last three years, I've done something pretty special each year. Um, so I don't know this year since I'm going back to the States. I yeah. am gonna go to Atlanta, so I think I'm gonna see my best friend. But I don't, I don't know yet what plans I have. Probably just low key. It'll be just nice to be oh. back in the states. Yeah. But oh, cool! Happy early birthday. Thank you. But yeah, so 28. So, and your son is how old? My son is two. Yeah, he just turned two in November. Okay, so young mom, and so I want to talk to you about what was what was that. Like, did you always want to be a mother? Was it something that you always knew? Um, was it planned, unplanned? It was definitely planned. Um, I'm the youngest of five, so I never really thought about um, being a caretaker for anybody else, to be honest, because <laughs> I was used to everyone else kind of looking after me and taking care of me. Um, but I would say after I married my husband and after we kind of had our first three years of getting to know each other and you know, the first three years were kind of rocky. After we kind of got more solid in who we were as a couple, it just kind of clicked. Like, okay, happily married, let's have a baby. So we, we got off the birth control, and it happened fairly quickly. And um, I don't know. I just think that, that for me, I write, I wrote this in my book. For me, um, marriage was kind of synonymous with having, with having kids. So I didn't really get the fact that I wanted to be a mom until I was until I was with my husband. Um, and and so now, how long have you guys been together? We've been together for about eight years. Okay. Yeah. And so now I can't imagine obviously having a life without my son. And now, you know, my husband always quotes me right when I right when my son came out of the hoo ha. I was like, I want another one <laughs> because I felt it was the best day of my life. I kid you not. So all my pregnant friends, I always assure them, like, don't fear the day of, you know, that you're going to be in labor. It's probably going to be the best day of your life. So we definitely want more, but I'm in the middle of kind of, you know, trying to figure out if, you know, when's the right time, even though there's never really that quintessential right time, we're still trying to kind of feel it out. Um, but we'll see. So for you personally, I want to ask about your husband as well, um, but for you, what was one of the hardest things that you had to adjust to um, after becoming a mother? Oh, definitely. My my spirit is just restless. I like to go. I like to be active. I love to, to be spontaneous and meet with friends on a whim. You know, I'm not a planner. 
you know, I like to just have fun kind of spontaneously. So you have this little adorable baby here, you know, you can't just get up and go. And if you are going to get up and go, you know, you're not going to be able to be as, as, um, I don't know. It's just for me being a mom, I really, really had a really hard, um, wake up call of it's not just about me anymore. And I have to be able to kind of balance my needs with my son's needs. And for me, that was the hardest thing of loving this little person so much, but still loving myself, you know, and trying to find that balance of, of how do I give him what he needs as, as my mom, as his mother, while at the same time, um, staying true to who I am and still going after my dreams. Um, so that's kind of what prompted me to write the book, Seven Habits of a Healthy, Happy Mom. Um, was just my thinking to myself, how am I going to still be me and still do all these things that I have in my heart that I have to do with this love of being a, a mother now and this love that I have for my son? So for me, that has been the hardest thing in my entire life is finding that balance of I adore you, but I still have these things I want to do. How do I how do I do both? Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I saw you, you said that um, in one of the, I think, uh, interviews that I saw of yours or one of your videos, you talked about that your your passions were born after your son. Um, which totally. Is yeah, yeah. So after I gave birth, you know, I just, I had kind of cabin fever because I was in the house just breastfeeding just my son and I. You know, my husband, since he's a chef, he was working like 80 hours a week still. So <laughs> when you're in the house alone for that long, you're just kind of like, mm. <laughs> so I had, a lot of, I had a lot of time to kind of reflect and journal and, you know, take that time off of work and school just to be a mom, which was the best time of my life. So, you know, I just, I was really happy, but I was really overwhelmed with all these new emotions and all these new dreams that just kind of came about after my son was born. Um, and I don't know, my intuition really, really started to talk to me, you know, I think when he was about a month old. And I just kept hearing, like, write a book. Like, you need to write about what you're going through right now in order to get more clarity and in order to be of some assistance. Which is, and then I, which is interesting that you, you know, because sometimes people say, you know, like you said earlier, waiting for the right time to be a parent until I've accomplished all my dreams. You know, I, I catch myself saying that never, <laughs> there's never a right time. But the cool yeah. thing with you is that actually your passion, um, you didn't even, you know, you didn't expect that you would be writing a blog about moms or a book. And it was birthed after the fact. So you never really know what life has in store for you. Yeah, and, and I think for me, the biggest key to my success so far, I mean, I still, you know, I haven't even touched what I want to do, but for me, it's always been listening to that inner voice. And my inner voice was overwhelmingly powerful when it said, moms wear heels. Like, I was literally just kind of in a sleepy kind of meditative state and just mom, moms wear heels popped into my head. And I know the best ideas for me personally, for blog topics, for the blog name, for the for my book, you know, all those um, ideas kind of sprouted organically and it just, I couldn't ignore it, you know? So I had never blogged before. I had never bought a domain name before. So it, it involved tons of research, tons of research, tons of work. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm, I got really good at, I guess, listening and, and discerning my ego from my inner voice after I had my son, hmm. for sure. That's interesting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that real quick, but I just want to ask you because I do know that we have a lot of, of viewers who are males, um, so they may not be able to relate to what it is physically having a child and pushing it out. <laughs> um, but from your husband, I mean, from you know what you guys have talked and things like that. What is what do you think was the hardest thing that you could tell or that you guys spoke about for him becoming a father? Oh, totally. That's that's an easy one. Um, he has an amazing work ethic, which means he's a workaholic. And that's part of what attracted me to him. But it's also his biggest shadow with being a father. You know, he's a great dad, but he always finds it really hard to, you know, his passion is the restaurant, a restaurant, Pasio Latin Fusion. So he finds it really hard to balance being a businessman and a chef with being a great dad. You know, when you're a chef and a restaurant owner at that, you're, you're easy pulling in 80 hours a week, you know? So the blessing in that is that I can take my son to the restaurant so they can see each other. But even then he's busy. 
Um, so I think for him, it's, it's just balancing his desire to take care of his family and do that well with giving his son more time. Yeah. And I think that's a common problem, um, issue that, you know, that most people face, especially in America is balancing out our, our work schedules and family life. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a big one. Yeah, for sure. And going back to your intuition, so you, do you feel that your inner voice started speaking to you more loudly after you had your, your son? Yeah, totally. And to backtrack a little bit, my inner voice told me I was ready to be a mom too, you know, and thank God that inner voice came when I was in a relationship, <laughs> you know? Yeah, imagine um, if you're out, you're not in the one. It's like, you know, let me not be on tender like, hey. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I just heard that intuition that said, now do it, proceed. And, and when I feel that you can't tell me anything like my sisters, they try to talk me out of it. They're like, you guys just opened up a restaurant. What are you thinking? Build your business and then try to have a baby. Hmm. And when I know that it's, you know, you can call it the Holy spirit, you can call it your intuition. You can call it your God, the divine presence, whatever it is you refer to it as once I know that that's where the voice is coming from, like I'm a hundred percent confident to move forward. Um, so that's kind of what, what prompted me to want to be a mom was knowing that it was the right time for me personally. And, and I totally forgot what you asked me because I had to say that. Sorry. No, no, you're going on track. I was just, uh, I was just asking that if you felt your intuition got stronger once you became a mom. So yeah. I'm going to ask you a question you asked me, um, a while back. Okay. How do you discern between your um, intuition voice and your ego? Oh, uh, I asked that. That was good. No. Yeah, that was a good question. <laughs> uh, I asked it because I was I was trying to remember how to do it. I think. Um, you know, that's a good question. Let me think for a second. Of course. For me personally, I know that my ego is is loud. My ego is like. Do this or you might fail. Do this or she'll get, you know, it's about competition and it's about um, comparison. For me, that's what my ego is all about. So it's like, if you don't want, you know, to be left behind, then do this. So I know my inner voice, my intuition is always about love. It's always about, uh, it's always more of a calming voice. Mm -hmm. And it's something that feels warming to my soul. It's something it sounds so cliche, but it's something that you know when you hear it. It, it just resonates with your entire being. Yeah. And my ego voice, it's loud, but it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with myself, you know? And um, kind of going off track a little bit, but staying on track, I know for me, my ego kept telling me to do a fitness competition. It's like, do this, and it'll you know, get you this many more followers, and it'll do this. But it wasn't something that the Holy Spirit or my intuition was guiding me to do. And that's why I kept failing at it. You know, I'd be on this clean eating diet for four weeks and then I'd stuff my face with whatever else I wanted to eat because it wasn't, that wasn't my divine calling. That's, so I'm, that's a I'm, big point that you're making right there because I think that, um, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to point this out because I know there's, there's a lot of good dialogue that's going to flow. Is people, when we do something for the wrong reasons, things get blocked. And when we see that things aren't working, as you were showing your example of your fitness competition. Yeah. So I wanted, you know, for you to continue to elaborate on that, but I just wanted to point that out for people to catch it because I think it's something that we all experience. You know, we want to do something, but I don't think we question what is the reason behind why we want to do it. Yeah. A big thing for me I think for the past several months is I always try to remember to ask myself what the intention is behind whatever I'm going to do. And I think we spoke about this last time I interviewed you. So for me, it's just reminding myself to ask that question, you know, because once I ask it, the, the, the answer is clear as day, you know, so anything I do, I try to, I try to really delve deep and ask myself why it's important. You know, for me, I think time is so valuable, which is why I refuse to have a nine to five that I don't like my time, especially after being a mom. It's like I cannot sell my time away from my son for something that is not, um, I guess, connected to my higher power, to my 
to my um, big destiny picture. If it's not something that's for me, you know, I, I stay away as much as possible. And that's tricky in today's day and age because we are, we kind of have a survivalist mentality. Of, I got to work. I got to do this. But if you look around, a lot of us are working for things that we don't necessarily need, you know. So I'd rather have that time to grow, to reflect, to go after my dreams rather than that extra income for me right now of working a nine to five. Hmm. So again, I don't know how we got here, but that just was something that was on my mind. <laughs> it's okay. It's a, that's why it's called a candid conversation. There's no, <laughs> no structure to it because I, yeah. think, I think these I are can. the, these are the best, honestly, um, the, the most growth that I do in my life and the best connections I have is through just having conversations with people and just, you know, like ex exploring. And then one thing leads to another and you're like talking about all kinds of things, but you can leave I, inspired. Can I ask you a question? Of course. So you're really good at getting information out of people. And it's you can tell it's because you have a genuine curiosity and you want to grow from other people's experiences. Would you ever be interested in doing that on TV or, you know, being having a TV show, for example? Like, what's your big dream? I'm really curious because this is something that you're really good at. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've never really, like, thought about it. I, I was told a long time ago um, by, a, like, one of my spirits that eventually I would be on TV. But um, it's not something I focus on. But, yeah, I do, I do love. This is really my passion. And m my dream is to be able to take candid conversation on a bigger level where I'm able to reach more people and do it on a bigger platform. Um, yeah. But this is what I love to do. I mean, my most favorite times is when I just hang out with people and I'm like, hey, come over to my house. Like, I'm not, like, I like partying and stuff like that, but on small doses. But my favorite thing is like, hey, come to my house. Let's talk or go to a restaurant and exploring people because it's just a synergy. And when you get going and it's genuine enough and people are open, there's mm -hmm. there's so much that you, you, I love walking away from a conversation and being like, oh, Damn, I have so much energy. I'm energized. I'm oh, inspired. Yeah. And so I actually yeah. have a friend, and um, I'm getting off track, but I have a friend in Florida that whenever I go to Florida, um, his name is Kevin, I always visit him. And he's also now um, one of my business partners helping me with my website. But we'll talk for six, eight hours, and the time will just fly. And every time I leave him, I'm like, oh, so yeah. energized and inspired. <laughs> No, yeah, it's 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 so. It just reminds you what life's about when you when you make those connections with people. It remind like it just makes you feel more alive. Like your cells are literally vibrating. You know, I think it's that's true. what we live for. Yeah, it is. It's the, co it's the connections. I mean, I it, it's like babies. They say you know in psychology, like you know babies. Uh, and I was reading actually a, a scientific uh, journal the other day, and it was talking about. A kid, like babies can actually survive without food longer than they can survive without yeah. love. You know? yeah. yeah, I've read that too. And the, the experiments they did, did in the 1950s um, with monkeys. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the um, no, just the importance of like human connection. No. It's vital yeah. to our survival. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in 2015, I wrote down my, my top values because I think it's important to just kind of reassess. So for me, it's authenticity, love, and success. And I can elaborate on that later. But I want to ask you, what are your core values for 2015? Um, freedom, which I started pursuing at the end of 2014 by following my dream of traveling the world. Yeah. Um, abundance, meaning uh, success. I, I, I'm ready to start uh, becoming successful at my passion. I think for a lot of a long time, I had a lot of resistance. <laughs> so I was trying to say, okay, I'm going to focus on my passion, but find other outlets to bring the abundance. Um, yeah. So this year, I definitely broke through it and I'm ready. Um, and then love, love has always been something that has been a focus, but it's more, I think this year for me, it's more love for me, self-love, um, and less focus on a relationship. Got it. Got it. So. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, okay. So getting back to you, Missy.
<laughs> I was watching one of your videos and you were going over different topics of your book, um, Seven Habits of a Healthy Mom. And there was something that you said, and actually we covered a little bit of it now, but you said something about don't, um, don't sabotage yourself. Yeah, I do have a chapter and it's inside the chapter. I say, don't sabotage your sexy. Yeah, don't sabotage <laughs> that's, your sexy. Think, yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It's, so that we're because it's, it's about other people. That's what it is. It's about not letting other people um, make you feel bad for wanting to be sexy or not dimming, dimming your own light. And I think that's a topic, one, that we can apply to motherhood, but also to anyone like you, you're young, you're a teenager, you know, that competition, and we have to shine our light because we're making somebody else uncomfortable. I know. To be honest, Stephanie, that that's the main reason why I've lost friendships and why I have a very big standard for friendships is if I have to dim who I am, if I have to make myself smaller, to be able to communicate with anybody, I can't do it. And I think that, you know, there is kind of a small population of just big, big beings in the world. People who are just, you know, they're in touch with, with their higher power and they, they, they feel powerful because of that. It doesn't have to do with, with vanity, like, oh, look at me. It's not even just, it's not about that. It's about something that you can't see. And those people can be very, very intimidating to someone who's not connected to their to their higher source, or to a source. You know, if you're in the world and of the world, you're just in a comp you're just in competitive mode. You're just looking at a girl and saying you're comparing yourself to her. And if she sizes up, you know, larger than you, then your ego is going to be hurt. You know, so I, I think that for all my friendships in 2015, I have to I have to be around people who who stand in their greatness. You know, I want to be around that energy. I don't want to be around anyone who, who shrinks because I've done that for much too much of my life. Just an example, like share a, a story. Um, I'm very, I'm really into like illustrations and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it happens all the time. You know, like let's, my husband calls me the life of the party. I don't know if I agree with that. I just love people. I love people and I love to connect with people. So I'm not going to be in the corner, you know, sipping a mate, just looking around. I'm going to try to engage, Right. So if I'm at a party and I start telling a story and we get really engaged and and I notice, you know, someone who I'm with, they kind of just start giving me looks. I'm big on energy. I can sense things, you know. So if I'm with someone and I just. I don't like the word jealousy, I really don't, because I think that it's a lot bigger than that, mm -hmm. but. I don't want to have to be around anyone who I feel like I have to get myself around because of something as minute as jealousy. Yeah. Because in my head, I'm like, you're beautiful. You know, I'm your friend because I love your energy. You know, we're very different. I think there's a meme going around on Instagram, like flowers don't compete, they just bloom. Oh, yeah, and that's how I feel. Yeah, that's how I feel. I'm like, I see, I see beauty in everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I see beauty in myself too. I think we all have to have an element of self-love. And, um, you know, just, just going to social, to get back to your question, just going to different social um, situations and, you know, getting, I don't know, just really in the moment, I, I can sense when people just start to kind of separate. Mm -hmm. And and one friendship I had, every time we would go out and, and we would go dancing and then, you know, that, that energy happened where you're kind of captivating the room and you're just being yourself. She would just always start arguments with her mate because she thought he was looking at me. And it sounds ridiculous it really does but I sense that and it made me uncomfortable because I'm like can we just be ourselves let's just have fun um so anyone who I spend time around and and I feel like their ego is more involved than you know love it just makes me feel uncomfortable you know and I think that if we're all being ourselves then we're it's just a big old love pot yeah, <laughs> and you're not no, worried about, you know and you're not worried about competition as much so, so that's, that's the best example I can think of because that was probably one of the biggest relationships or friendships that I've lost recently because I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't do that competition. I'm like, I just want to get along. You know, I don't want to be getting in, in between you and your spouse. It shouldn't even be like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause it's people's, um, it's unfortunate cause it happens a lot, but it's people's insecurities on insecurities that they throw on you. 
Yeah. They and don't, I'm like, they don't I feel can't. comfortable with themselves. So to see someone else in their own space is kind of like, yeah. And, but it's good. It's good for us to talk about this because I know that a lot of people suffer from this. And I think it's important to realize that I used to, I used to, when I was a lot younger, dim my light all the time and not realizing why I didn't even realize I was doing it, but it was almost like, you know, I was always having problems with girls and it came down to a boy, if this boy liked me or, and I'm like, and before you know it, I realized I was like trying to not even be seen. And, right. And then you, and then you grow up and just realize what, for what, like, who cares? Yeah. And that's kind of where Don't Sabotage Your Sexy came in because I literally, because of that friendship and another one, I started to literally sabotage my sexy. And this dates back to high school. I kid you not, I would have girls like, I grew up in Chicago, so I would have girls like trying to fight me after school. Oh, you looked at my boyfriend? What? I was just, I was so confused, genuinely confused. Like, I don't get it. So, so in high school, I literally, subconsciously, I put on 30 pounds. I got big when I was about 18. And I know that that had a lot to do with sabotaging my sexy, dimming my light, just wanting to not be uh, bullied anymore I'm just like yeah so I gorged I gorged and I ate fast food every day and and I'm never going back to that because I've done that and and once you dim your light to make someone else's shine brighter you're miserable so of course I would go through the biggest depression of my life upon gaining those 30 pounds because on a deeper level I knew that I was killing myself you know I think that when you just step away and you hide um, especially when you feel like you have a purpose, you know, you feel like you're dying, you know? So I was very depressed after graduating high school and, and yeah, that's a whole story in and of itself. <laughs> high school and middle school, I mean, for anybody who's watching and is still in high school, it's just, it, those are tough, tough years. Um, it's you know, tough. Yeah. <laughs> even though, even though most of the people that you think are important in high school or middle school right now, let me tell you something, they're not important. <laughs> most of the popular right? people are usually not very popular and successful in real life. Um, no, because that popularity has to do with stuffing other people down. All the popular girls in my school were mean. I'm like, I don't want to be like that. Actually, bullying is such a big thing that so many people go through and it's, it's no fun. And I, I think now it's worse like I think about being a teenager now I mean kids the- are kids are brutal <laughs> these days I mean I thought they were bad growing up nowadays yeah. like you know people are committing suicide and things like that because they can't handle it and mm-hmm. um it's just no way to be so it's good that we're talking about this because I think for anybody watching this who has experienced that or maybe is going through that and they don't realize that they're self-sabotaging um, dimming their own light because they don't want to get bullied. You know, for them, I just say, don't, like you said, don't dim your light. Actually, I think it's the opposite. The less you dim your light and the more you're yourself, people will eventually start gravitating to you. Yeah, totally, totally. And um, if, if you do have high school viewers, I, I always like to tell my nieces who are in high school, kind of a list of things I wish I knew in high school. So I'm trying to think about at least one that we could give our, our viewers who might be, you know, struggling with that. And for me, um, I wish I would have known in high school that that it's okay to be who you authentically are. Even if even if that light, you know, is a little bright on some people's faces, it's still your duty to be your authentic self because that your life is is your message to the world, even in high school, of course, you know? So I wish I knew that back then. Like it took me a while to get comfortable with who I really am because, you know, we both, we have big personalities, you know, and we love to share, we love to connect. And that can come off as like a lot of energy, you know? So for some people, you know, not everyone's meant to understand your energy. Not everyone is meant to, but those friends, like the friend you said you have in Florida, who you always see and you can talk to for eight hours, those are the people that, that matter because they're the ones who everyone matters, but they're, they're the ones who really are going to help you kind of remember like a feeling of coming home. Yeah. Almost. I call, I call no? them my, my familiars. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Because I, I mean, honestly, I think that it's great to have a lot of people. There's a lot of people nowadays who know a lot of people, but mm-hmm. having a core group, even if you just have one person, 
who's like authentic mm-hmm. for me my most value thing in a person is authenticity mm-hmm. if i can have if i can be open and raw and honest and i know that you can tell me how it is and i can tell you how it is those relationships for me are priceless and are the only kind of relationships that i really ever want to engage in because like you said time is valuable <laughs> time is it valuable is. to waste with superficiality and and uh, bull- bullshit conversations and friendships yeah. it's not worth yeah. it yeah I agree. And that's why whenever I know I, I, I am ready to call something into my life, I always put it out there in, in the universe, you know. So I said, you know, hey, universe, I'm ready to attract relationships, male or female. But I, I do want some 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 female relationships that I do feel like I connect with. You know, my sisters are busy, so I don't get to see them as much. And and I think it's important to have that sisterhood, you know, but I want to make sure that it's that it's for me, again, authenticity is huge. So if I can't be who I am, if you're going to be judging me, if I tell you something about my marriage or if I tell you something about my past, then then it's not going to work. You know, I have to be able to show all all parts of me, not just the good parts, you know, because we all have struggles. So I, I never want to feel like I have to wear a mask in any relationship, you know? Yeah, I feel you. Yeah. So I know that we're jumping around. Um we talked a little bit about mummyhood and then we came to um, talking more about dimming your light. But mm-hmm. also, since we're on this topic about not sabotaging our sexy and dimming our light, you also mentioned in one of your videos about feeling guilty. for mm-hmm. you, for After you became a mom, one of the things that you realized is that you found it hard to do something for yourself because it made you feel guilty. It's so hard. So why? Yeah. Why do you find it? Why do you feel guilty when you want to do something for yourself because you're a mom now? You know, feeling guilty when you're a mom is one of those, everyone's going to have it. Everyone, every mom I've ever talked to struggles with that. And that's why, that's kind of the whole premise of my book. It's like, if you want your child to be happy, authentic, healthy, then you better be living that lifestyle. And I don't think my son would be happy if my if his mom, me, was just at home just being a mommy 100% of the time because then I'd be out of bounds. Mm-hmm. So I am really, really um, conscious of who I allow to watch my son. But thankfully, we do have a really small support system here that if I need to go on a date night with my husband, it's so important You know, the first year of my son's life, we just, we didn't really do anything and our marriage suffered. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hold on, babe, let's backtrack. If if we want to be happy, if we want our son to to witness love, we have to take care of this thing called love. You know, that's, that's an energy. That's a relationship. That's, to me, it's the most important thing because if my husband and I aren't together, then, you know, all hell's going to break loose at home, you know, and I don't want my son to, to feel that. Um, so we make time for a date night. You know, I make time to, to take care of myself and work out. You know, I make time to, where's my book? I make time to read, (laughs) you know, I think it's just so important uh, to feed your spirit every day. And I think that moms, especially moms who have nine to five, we, we just feel, well, I don't have a nine to five, but I just feel like moms who have to work and balance everything feel extremely just time ridden like there's no there's not enough time to nurture themselves and take care of their home it's the hardest thing that that women can do and in this day and age we're expected to do it all and and to do it all in high heels you know (laughs) so I have a lot of empathy with with working moms but I also feel like we have to find more time we have to create more time we have to create more space in order to do the things that make our heart sing because if our hearts aren't singing, if we're not happy, our kids feel that. Absolutely. So do you want, you know, do you want to just, do you want to support them financially and be there? Or do you want to create a life with them? Yeah. You know, I, I'd much, I'd much rather give my son my energy than my money if I had to choose. Obviously, we need it all. Um, Obviously, I'm not a mother, but I have made so many observations growing up and just you know, watching different people. I, I like to observe a lot. And I see that mothers often when they become a mother, it's mm-hmm. like they lose who they are and they forget about their marriage. 
and they forget about their dreams and they, they let it all go and then they're overweight and it's not, but maybe they weren't always overweight and then all of a sudden now they are and they, they cut their hair super short and they <laughs> wear, well, I mean, <laughs> I know because we were talking okay, about this earlier. Okay. <laughs> but, and they, they, they start wearing like jogging clothes. I don't know. They just lose themselves. You know, I think I think everyone is different. For me, I do I do care about image. I think everyone is different, but I think on on a broad level, we all care about how we look. Let's just keep it real. You know, I love to feel good about how I look. So yeah, I had all these emotions going through me once I had my son. Like that is the biggest hormonal drop you will ever experience. Like I went from being nine months pregnant to okay, now I have a baby to take care of. It's crazy. Um, but of course I wanted to lose the weight. Of course I wanted to get in the best shape of my life actually, because prior to having my son, I, you know, I danced professionally, so I was long and lean, but I didn't have like muscle or anything. So after I had my son, I was just like, I went on beast mode, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I was did gonna the- ask you, was that an easy process? Were you always like, you said you were a dancer, but were you always, uh, going to the gym, very athletic? I was, I was athletic. Um, Hold on, I'm sorry, my son just cried, kind of threw me off for a second. But I was always athletic, but like I said, after high school, I gained those 30 pounds, you know? So I was barely recognizable. My face was like that. And then, so I lost that upon moving to Albuquerque. I kind of, I like transformation, I like change. So I was like, I'm gonna move from Chicago to Albuquerque and I'm gonna change my life around. So I kind of did that. Um, and I was thin, but I wasn't strong, you know? I didn't feel strong. So, I gained about 55 pounds when I had my son, and after I had him, I still looked, you know, at least 40 pounds overweight, because you don't lose that much once the baby comes out, <laughs> so um, it wasn't easy. It, it, it's really hard, and I think that, you know, all the women that I coach off my blog, they understand the, fun- the fundamentals. We all understand if you want to lose weight, okay. Eat an apple and go for a jog. We get that. You eat more food from God and you move your body. It's not complex. So what I find is the biggest issue between women and the body that they want, it's always eating for security. It's always eating for comfort. It's being afraid to go to the gym because it's a new experience. It always goes a little bit deeper. And I actually lose a lot of clients when we start to talk about those things because I'm like, I'm not just going to, yeah, I'm not just going to give you um, diet plans, if we're not talking about why it's hard for you to stick to them. You know, I think transforming your body is one of the hardest things you can do because it tests your discipline. It tests your, Mental I mean, can you, can you say, can you say no to the piece of cake if it's right there? That's hard, especially when you're going through things emotionally and you want that comfort, you know? So we all struggle with our own addictions, but I think that that food is, is the biggest, um, accepted addiction, especially in America, where that's just, it's used for comfort. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I was curious about that because that's something that I, I always wondered, especially when one day in the future when I become a mother, I was worried about that. Not, well, I can't lie, I am a little vain. <laughs> but... <You're up. laughs> But I always wonder that because I'm like, oh, my God, like, it's, I don't want to gain, like, you know, 50 pounds and then it's going to be a mission to lose them. But yes, I and I, I mean, I don't even know what the state of mind would be like with all the hormones and things like that. But I do know that it's something that's hard for a lot of women. Um, you know, we see TV and Hollywood and all that, and that's not real life. But for the average working woman, it's it's difficult because you're, you're working, your husband, the house, it's just too many things to juggle. Mm-hmm. But um, you've done a great job, and you look amazing. I mean, your body's like banging. You're sweet. But I wanted to say something. Um, it's funny because once you, one of my biggest um, resolutions or intentions for 2015 is to get more organized with my schedule. You know, since I do the majority of my work from home, you know, I take all my classes from home. I do everything from here, so it's easy to lose track of a schedule. Um, but ironically. Once, let's say, let's use an example. Let's say there's a working mom. She works nine to five. She has two kids and she has a husband to take care of. You know, if if you, if you wake up at 5 a.m. and you're at the gym by 530, 
you get dressed at the gym, you're at work by nine, you know, you take your lunch break and you, you know, uh, try to be productive. I don't know. Everyone has their own list of things they have to do, but you're productive during that lunch break as well. You bring your lunch because again, you're eating healthy. So you bring your lunch to work. You save that time of not having to go, you know, fetch a lunch. You're off of work. Uh, you've already done your workout, you know, you food prepped. So you could spend, let's say, two to three hours with your kids working on homework. Um, dinner, you just have to heat up because you already food prepped on Sunday. And then hopefully you can have some romantic time with your husband at nighttime, you know. So for me, um, I know that if I ever do have to work full time at a TV station because I might be getting hired full time. I'm extremely nervous about that because I have gotten accustomed to and kind of spoiled with being able to work from home and to pick up my son all day, you know. So I'm nervous about that, but I know that if that's what the universe wants for me, I know what's going to happen and I'm just getting ready. And that's why I'm, 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 I just bought a crock pot yesterday. Like I'm getting really good at food prepping because it's so important. If you come home and you're starving and there's chips in the cupboard, you're going to eat those chips because who really wants to wait for the chicken to be broiled? You know what I'm saying? So it's all about, it's all about, you know, planning and having the discipline and, and blocking out your time and, and scheduling what's important. You know, it's amazing how many moms tell me they don't have time. But then when we look at their schedule, they're watching TV three hours a day. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have time? You were on Facebook at work for an hour. You know, let's really figure it out. You know, because we all have 24 hours a day. That's we true. all do. And I, th- I think something, too, that we need to ask ourselves for anybody watching this, because one, it's not about having like the perfect body or getting, it's just about taking care of yourself and being healthy and having energy. That's all that it really is. And two, I think that when we decide that we want to do something, that we have a goal, let's say, you know, I, I want to be fit and I want to be healthy. You also have to realize, do you want the pain and the struggle that comes with it? Because a lot of times we only focus on the reward of something, you know, we want this and we think we really want it, but a lot of times we don't really want what we say we want because we don't want the struggle um, that comes with it. We only want the benefit. So, you know, you want a good body, but do you really want the fact that you might have to wake up an hour earlier, you know, to go to the gym? Do you want the struggle of the of pain? You know, I know I hate squats. <laughs> I love squats. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm, I'm trying to train myself every day to do squats on my own so that I can build up. But, you know, it's like, do you want the pain that comes with the reward? Right. And I think the biggest thing with with what we're talking about is is being uncomfortable. As human beings, we're we're basically trained to, to fear and to reject anything that is not comfortable. So that's why there's only, you know, between five and 10 percent of the entire population that are actually living their dreams. Because like you said, that takes you out of your comfort zone that's hard it's going to be more challenging and we're we have been bred since we were little youngins we have been bred to not like that feeling so that's why i think success is so attainable i don't have the same mindset that the average person has because i don't think that it's unattainable i think that i can kind of manifest what i really want once i know what i really want you know so it's all about who's willing to put themselves out there who's willing to be who they really are and who's willing to be uncomfortable in the process. Cause that's where you're going to reap the most rewards. You're not going to reap rewards by sitting home on the couch, not changing your habits, you know, cause that's comfortable. Exactly. So I think that's the biggest thing for me. I, 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 I try to face my fears every day, do something that I'm afraid of every day because I, you have to get comfortable with it. Cause the fear is not going anywhere. No. You know, it's just how comfortable are you with it, with facing it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I that's what I'm working on right now. That's awesome. And yeah. you you said um, obviously you don't think like the average person, and, and I agree because I resonate a lot with your energy from the moment that we first talked. Um, mm-hmm. Where where do you think that that came from? Um, being more because I I think it comes down to being more introspective, um, and being in touch with yourself. When did that start for you? Were you always in touch with yourself? You are so good at hearing stuff and then like packaging it and then like yeah you're really talented at that because I'm like yeah that that is what I was thinking <laughs> um, but I have you know I grew up in a family of major dysfunction like it's it's statistically I should be a hot mess which I kind of am but I, I keep it under <laughs> I keep it under control no but growing up in a family that my mom was 
you know, part-time schizophrenic, like literally mental hospitals and struggling with her, her own alcoholism and then having to raise five kids. And then we were homeless. You know, we grew up in extreme poverty. And, and for me, my, I found solace. I found pleasure. I found joy in reading. So even since I was four, five, six years old, I remember just shutting the door, (laughs) everyone else in the living room, you know, watching a tiny little black and white TV. And I would go to the room with my little juice and I would be in heaven. I would create my own reality with the books I was reading. So that has stuck with me. You know, I've always, I've always liked to, like you said, observe and, and learn from what I observe and, and write. I've always kept a journal too. So I think, I think that's a huge asset that people tend to overlook is being introspective. You know, I watched an, an interview on you this morning. I was like trying to get inspired. So I watched one of your interviews and you said something about, um, you said something about, um, I know when we talked, you were talking about if you're not writing in your journal, you're usually hiding from an aspect of yourself. Yeah, yeah. And that, ooh, that really hit me because I'm like, ooh, that's, it's just something that we all overlook. Like, if you talk to the average person, let's say you're at Target, the average person is not going to be keeping a journal because they're so busy and they're not really wanting to look in that mirror, you know? Most people don't, don't get... Which is which is was a common denominator that I found when people feel connected to me or they're like, you know, find themselves having deep conversations with me. And for me, it's something normal. I experience it every day in my life because it's just the way that I am. Um, and but I realize it's not that I'm any different. It's just that we are not conditioned. Most people aren't introspective, so they don't ask themselves deep questions. So if they don't ask themselves, so then it's even less likely that they're going to ask another person deep right questions and that's the number right. one ingredient right. to build a connection and i want to stress that too because i think that how i when i say certain things that can come off like i think i'm up here i really don't think i'm special in the sense of oh i was born with something no i think that we all have the same potential more or less to to be comfortable in our own skin to go after the things that we want. Now, we all have different destiny paths. So my destiny is going to look a lot different than yours, even though we have a lot of similarities. My destiny is going to look a lot different than Beyonce's. You know what I'm saying? We all have our own pot of the gold at the end of the tunnel. But what strikes me is, like, we all have the same resources, more or less. Like, we all have our body, that that spirit that I, that I talk about, that I feel connected to when I'm at my best. That's there for everybody. So for me, when people ask me, like, how do you stay so inspired? I'm like, how do you not? It's there for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wake up, I feed my spirit. I read something up, up, uplifting and, and those things help. But like you said, you have to be willing to look in the mirror and look in your own eyes. If you can't look in your own eyes, you can't look in someone else's. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think if, you know, the people who are watching this, just get comfortable you know, wake up and before you go to bed, just look in the mirror and just say, you're beautiful. <laughs> and it sounds so corny, but just get comfortable with who you are, whether you have to do it naked or or whatever. You know, I think that once you can own who you are, then you're then you can be a little bit more fearless with doing the things that you're called to do. Mm-hmm. And you made so. a good point, you know, growing up, you you from what you shared with us, you obviously grew up not in the ideal condition environment. No. Um, but you turn inward because you turn to books and um, it's something yeah. that I, I, I find amazing. I talk about it. You know, when I have kids, I, I'm like, I, I see kids all the time and I'm like, wow, they have so much toys, like an abundance of shit that they don't even play with. And I'm like, you mm-hmm. know, I see my nephew he has so much stuff. And I was like, you know what? When I have kids, I made a decision. I was like, they're going to have very minimal toys and That's more good. hands on, more books. I'm going to invest in books and getting them interactive discussions because for me it's here when you can get your mind working at an early age to think critically yeah everything else it's like that spark just you know you you lit it yeah yeah Um, and i think you know a message to the moms if there are moms out there and women who want to become moms you know in this age that our kids are being born in it's all about technology so be very weary and very, really cautious about how much time your kids spend. My son is two and he's a pro on my smartphone. And I said, 
I told my husband, we have got to make sure we're limiting his time. Even if what he's watching is educational, I don't want to dim his imagination. So I'm like, I'm like what you said. I'm much more hands on. Let's go outside. Let's run around. Let's play. You know, let's, you know, he jumps on my back and he does push ups with me and he's active. And, and I relish in that. And I love that because I want my son to be, you know, to be able to move his body and to have that be a source of entertainment. You know, you don't have to always look outside of yourself to be entertained. I think that's so important. But, you know, even the average adult I talk to, they're like, have you seen the new episode of this? And I'm like, I've never even heard of that show. And I'm glad because I don't want to spend my life watching other people's dramas. Like, it might be okay in small doses, but at the same time, it's like, I want to be involved in my drama. You know, this is fun, too. So I think that we tend to use uh, watching TV as an escape from our reality. Yeah, and I told my husband, we can go to the movies every once in a while, but I'm going to need you to talk to me. Like, you got all this energy. I, I see all your energy. Can we connect? So that's something we're very opposite in that way. Of I have to be able to like know what's going on in your soul, and he's like, "That ain't none of your business." Oh, <laughs> I was like, "I've been waiting to get into that topic." <laughs> but wait, so yes, I I agree with you about TV being an escape. That that totally yeah. because whenever I want to shut my brain down and I'm tired of thinking, I'm like, "All right, I'm gonna go watch a show." Um, right, because I don't I don't have to think. But sometimes it's bad because you get you know you get into a habit and an addictive habit. Um, yeah. So before we move on to what you just said, you said that when you were connecting with your spirit, you were reading a lot when you were younger and things like that. When did you really start connecting like with your your own spirituality? Um, was that something that you were taught? It, it was your, your family? Are you no. When I hit my rough bottom. <laughs> was that that's why I'm great. That's why I'm grateful for all the shit I've gone through. Because when I hit my rock bottoms, that's when I start searching for light. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we're comfortable, you know, I think that, you know, before we're born, I think we do see somewhat of a, a, a blueprint into the lives that we're going to be born into. I think that our souls have a chance of saying, ah, I don't want this assignment this time. You know, it's a little bit too much. Or, yes, I'm ready to graduate with this life. You know, that's just a theory. Esoteric. I could be completely wrong. But that's what I think. And And for me, I think my life was a struggle with having a mom who suffered from schizophrenia and having a dad who wasn't there. You know, I think, and growing up in poverty, it shaped who I am. It shaped me to really appreciate when I can feed my son healthy, nutritious foods, you know? And, you know, we grew up hungry half the time. I would go to school on an empty stomach. You know, I'm so grateful that I can feed my son. And and back to what you said, you know, in high school, that was my first real, you know, rock bottom. And it sucked. Like, I wouldn't wish that on people. I wouldn't wish that severe depression that I had on anybody. And that's what baffled me the most. That's what made me so sad. It's like, why would anyone want to make someone else's life so shitty? I don't get it. That's just not the type of person I am. So... Not having the language, not having the resources to understand that, hey, you are different in that sense. Hey, you are really empathetic and compassionate because you've gone through hell growing up. And and not ever wanting to take that out on another innocent person. You know, that's what kind of hardened my depression. But at the same time, I'm grateful for it because that's when I started to read uh, philosophical books. That's when I started to really get into journaling, really examining my addictions. You know what I'm saying? Growing up seeing an alcoholic mom, you know, it's kind of easy. You know, my, my siblings and I laugh about it, but I'm like, can we have a good conversation without a glass of wine? <laughs> you know, it's like you can become, you know, you can start to exemplify patterns from your childhood. And it's subconscious, you know? So I've always been, um, I guess, willing to look at myself and that has made it a little bit more difficult for me to find solace in relationships because a lot of people aren't willing to have that talk with you. Even calling my dad and calling my mom and saying, hey, this happened. Can you, you know, can you shed some light on this? And they're in such denial. I hope they don't see this video, but they're in such denial of, no, we were never homeless. My mom literally says, oh, we were never homeless. So she has stuffed and stuffed and stuffed. And my dad has stuffed and stuffed to where I cannot get 
closure for my parents with shitty things that have happened in the past. So where do you look? You look here. You look there. And for me, you know, I look at the universe as my, are my parents. That sounds interesting, but, you know, my parents are flesh and blood. They're, they're flawed human beings, and they don't really want to talk about things that are hard to talk about. And I had to accept that because they gave birth to me, and I love truth, and I value truth more than anything else. So, of course, there's strife in, in those relationships, you yeah. know? And it's interesting because yeah. you, you, you said a lot of great things there, and right now what you just said, contrast, you know, a lot of times mm. we're born into shitty environments and in the moment we're like, why, you know, my life sucks. I was born into this, but you were born into a major contrast because of it. You're the opposite of it, you know, because your parents don't want to look at themselves. You want to look at yourselves. You know, they don't want to have those hard talks. You, it, it gave birth. It gave rise to these new, yeah. you know, version of yourself. Um, so I do agree with you. Again, it's just our opinions and perspectives about the blueprints. You know, when you come in, picking an environment and your parents and the kind of situations you want to be in. But I also notice a pattern in people who have who are awakened within themselves spiritually, and, and not in a religious way, but are just you know in touch with themselves and a higher being. Is that it's usually in our darkest times that we awaken. Yeah, yeah, and most I was I'm actually in the middle of uh, writing an article on you know some of the greatest leaders of our times became heroes, the heroes of our time, like Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, um, became heroes when they were faced with a really hard challenge that made them stand up for something they believed believed in, or there was a a defining moment that changed mm -hmm. everything for them. And so I think that sometimes we have to just be grateful for the struggles that we find ourselves in and say, hey, this might be an opportunity for me to define this moment. What am I going to make of it? Because I think we mm. can get lost in it, but there's power in, in, in the darkness of our lives. And just to add to that, I think that it's really, really hard to forge your own path when you don't see any footsteps. Because what you just said made me see that image in my head of like, we, we are all on our own, very unique path in life. And we're constantly looking to compare because society has taught us to believe that there's one way to do it. You know, you go to school, you graduate, you have the house, you get the car with a two-car garage, and you live happily ever after. But we all know life is a lot more complex than that. So for me, what's been incredibly uh, difficult, but that I had to become a co conscious of, is I have my own path. I can really look up to a Maya Angelou, you know. Um, I can really admire things that you say, but I have my own path. And I have to know the appropriate footsteps um, to get to that destiny moment that we all are here to do. You know, I think that we all forget that there's a much broader purpose than we see day to day. You know, we just see the grind of going to work and then we get caught up in materialism and consumism. We think that we don't have that new brand screen TV that, you know, we ain't shit. That's not the case. You know, so once we delve deeper and again, touching on the introspection part of it, once we can get in touch with what our divine calling is, then I think life instantaneously gets more bright. You know, I'm happy. I'm excited about life because I feel connected to my purpose. If I wasn't connected to my purpose, I would probably be depressed again. You know, and we all have cycles. I have days when I'm sad. Mm -hmm. And those, those days when I'm sad, I'm disconnected. And I forget why I'm here. And once we forget why we're here, we're fucked. Excuse me, but we are screwed if we forget. Because then it, we're just drones. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have anything uh, substantial to keep us going. And it can't just be about getting a check. No, it can't. It can't. But you said the word purpose, and just to play devil's advocate, um, there might be some people who say, you know, you use that word, and sometimes that it can bring a lot of pressure to people because they're like, oh, I don't know what my purpose is. What do I have a purpose? Does everybody have a purpose? Does it have to be this grand, big design? Um, so, what's your thought on that? No, I don't think that everyone's purpose is going to look like, I don't know why Tyra Banks just popped into my head. If you, you might not be America's next top model. You might not be the next Oprah. You might not be the next Bill Gates. But I, I definitely think we all have an inherent divine 
purpose if we are conscious enough to listen to our inner voice and take those steps. So, you know, um, even becoming a mom, not everyone is meant to balance having these grandiose dreams of being a mom. Some people find it very, very uplifting and, and simply compelling just to be a stay at home mom. And I don't mean just to be, to be demeaning. I mean, to, to focus on that solely, but here's the thing, your feelings will always tell on you. So if you're being a stay at home mom, you're trying that role on and you feel this nagging calling. It's all right here. <laughs> if you feel that, that is a sign from your divine presence. What's next? You have something else to do. You're not done. You know, so for me, my feelings tell on myself all the time. I really, really did kind of want to be content with being just a mom because life is simple. I feed my son. You know, we have fun. We play blocks. We do flashcards and I go to bed. But my my soul is just it's not content because I know I have a purpose that that um, extends out of my family, extends out of being a mother. So I think that it's our job. That's why we're here is to find out what those inner voices, what that's leading you to. So it's going to look so different for everybody. And I think that's where we stumble is we forget that our purpose isn't meant to be like everyone else's. I might not end up on TV full time and I'm going to be okay with that because I think that what's meant for me will happen because I'm putting in the work. Right. If I'm putting in the work and I'm listening to my inner guidance and I get fired from a job, that wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay. With that. Thank you for letting me go. You know, I think that we get so afraid of what if I lose my job, then say thank you. If you were doing what you were supposed to be doing and doing it with integrity and, and the universe released you from that position, be grateful. That means that you had to be forced out of that because you're not willing to, to leave. Yeah. So, you know, I, <laughs> I love this topic. There's so much in here. Yeah. Yeah. And then just one more thing I, I was thinking is it's so important. I want anyone who's watching to, to know this. If the universe is knocking on your door and you are ignoring it and you are suppressing it, that is the most dangerous thing you can do with your life. And I get really passionate when I talk about this because don't, don't do that. If you are hearing something and you know it's a call and that call is for you, the knock will get louder and the knock will get louder and it's going to turn into a banging. And if you ignore the bang, then your life is going to be shaken. Don't let your life be shaken by the universe partner with the universe and forge a path for yourself. So for me, I talk to the universe like it's you, like it's my homie, you know? What are we doing today? I, I always hear my guidance for the day because I don't want to be shaken anymore. I've had enough of those in my life. I don't want any more if I can, you know, if I have a say in it. And I think that the more you listen to your your divine guidance, the 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 more smooth your road on this life will be. I agree. So that's just by that. Yeah, I try to anyway. No, that I mean that this is an amazing topic. I I, I love this kind of topic because it's, it's what I live for. The you know the connection and listening to your voice. But you said something, and I you're spot on. We have to listen to so many times. The ninety eight percent of the time, we know what we need to do, but we're not willing to do it because we're afraid of. Okay, I know I need to leave my job, but I don't. I'm afraid because if I do it, then what? And I noticed the pattern in my own life is that every time I don't do something that I know I need to do, the universe is going to do it for me. But when the universe does it for you, it's always worse because it doesn't come. Yeah. It comes in a hard blow. The universe is dramatic, yes. girl. The universe is just like, I'm going to show you because you keep ignoring the signs. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of times, exactly, when, we, when something happens and we're like, well, Why? If we really were to be introspective and look, it's because we knew we needed to do something and we didn't do it. You know, there's a relationship that we needed to leave and we haven't left. And then it isn't until it blows up into pieces that we're like, oh, shit, okay. <laughs> but um, I got you. Oh. one thing I just want to point out is that what you said about, you know, someone who maybe just wants to be a mom and mm -hmm. that that might be their purpose. And there's nothing wrong with that, because I think that you know, with social media and everything that we have going on now, and, you know, I know, you know, doing YouTube videos and things like that, somehow it may seem that everybody's looking for um, to be famous or to do something grand. And mm -hmm. I think that it's okay to know, hey, some people, you know, want to be a gardener and they have this amazing green thumb. 
and that's really their passion but maybe you're afraid to pursue that because you think that's not enough you know you can't make right. you can't have all the money you can't have the amount of money you want being a gardener um but i think that if you just focus on the craft or the craft itself everything else that's meant to come will come because you don't know you know what you can create out of being a gardener you might get an idea that can spring another idea and you know and you can create something like but i think that when we focus on the success aspect of it we we lose sight of what's really important and then that's when we find ourselves things not working out like when you were doing your fitness competition um you know you were doing it not really because you wanted to do it but you were doing it because maybe you thought this would be the faster shortcut to get you to where you really wanted to be so I think that we need to know that it's okay if being a mom is really what you want to do right now. You don't need to have a big grand career or, you know, a big project that you're working on. If you want to be a mechanic and that's what you love, like, those are our purpose because we need those things. And I think the purpose comes down to being happy. Yeah. Because yeah. we can be doing a lot of shit and it can seem like our life is really exciting, like we're doing all these things, but there's people in the world who have it all, who are doing, who have a million projects going on, they have all this money and access. And there's some people that I've talked to and they're just really unhappy individuals. You know, they have all the money, but they don't have time to spend the money because they're always working. They have the most yep. beautiful family in the world, but they don't enjoy the family because they don't have time to enjoy the family. You know, uh, yeah. and I look at people who have a lot of money and I'm always like, well, when I have a lot of money, I'll get to travel the world. And half of the people who have a lot of money don't really travel much, you know? And I know. I know. <laughs> so it's it's just crazy. I know we're, we're kind of going on a tangent, but I think this is something that is a good topic. Yeah. And I want to share a personal story. I blogged about it once. And it's really hard for me to talk about, which means I probably should talk about it. Last time we spoke, I know you were in a kind of a weird, uncertainty place with your husband, and you were going through some personal stuff and questioning your relationship. So I wanted to see if you feel comfortable enough to share where you were then and where you are now. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Candid conversations. I expect it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I take... I take every day as a new, I take it day by day because I think what is so difficult with marriage, especially marriage when you get married when you're 20, because we've been married since we were 20. I think what makes it so challenging is the simple fact that we grow, we change, we evolve. So my husband is a very strong being in and, of itself, in and of himself. He might not be as outgoing as I am with it, but I know he has a really big purpose he feels like he needs to fill. So his, his um, I guess, loyalty to that and my, my, like you said, intense loyalty to doing what I feel like I need to do, you know, my fear is that what if they don't, eh, <laughs> what if they don't correlate, you know, and then, you know, my biggest battle from then when we talked and still to now is is the conformity aspect because we're still in the middle of defining our marriage. And it might not be what 90% of the public says is okay. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, talk to family members or friends and they're just like, what? Like, that's not how it's done. You know, you shouldn't be able to go out and go out with your friend and dance with somebody else. That's not how it's supposed to be. And I'm like, hold up. Who made these rules? Number one, who said I have to follow them? And number three, we have to figure out what makes us most most happy. So we talked about the whole um, kind of exploring ourselves and seeing where that would take us. And it didn't feel right, um, mainly because we have this beautiful little boy who we love waking up to and we love, you know, putting him down to, to go to sleep. And, and I don't want to take that away from my husband and I don't want to be away from that ever either. So we made the more selfless decision of let's just be best friends. Let's, let's fall, let's fall back in love that way. Cause for us, when we look at marriage, how everyone else looks at marriage, we struggle. But when we look at it, like, man, you're my homie. Like we, let's just be friends. Who love each other that's when we're in love and um i think again with everything in life i think we all have to 
do what works for us, you know, and, and I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years. You know, I don't know where my husband wants to be in 10 years. He's actually wanting to open up another restaurant. <laughs> so with my dreams, it's, it's very difficult to grow together in any relationship, you know? So we're working on that every day, every day. And I wish I could sit here and tell you, like, we're in love 24-7. Like, we don't argue. No, that's not how it is. Um, we still, we're still trying to find ourselves in a union. So that's the biggest, uh, I guess, a challenge of marriage. And I think that's why it's hard for me to talk about this with other people, not you, but with other people who are married. Because they don't take off the mask. You know, I'll sit there and I'll talk with a friend and she's like, oh, well, we don't, we don't. It's just like the energy of, oh, we don't struggle with that. You're, you know, I can't, it's hard for me to be transparent when I feel like someone else won't take off their mask. Mm-hmm. So it's been really hard to go through uh, the struggles of my marriage without feeling like I have someone to talk to who's willing to share their own strifes and so we can grow together. You know, that's the only reason why I'm okay with sharing my personal information because it might help somebody out there so they know they're not alone, you know? So I wish there was a little bit more of that so I could talk to more friends who are married, but every everyone's so focused on the Facebook, you know, having the pictures where you just you look like everything's perfect. And that's not reality. It's very difficult to share your life with someone, even when you love them, because we love each other and it's still a work in progress, you know? Yeah, and I, I you said about, you know, people not wanting to be authentic and share their stuff. And I think that that's where people find themselves uh, mostly isolated because everybody's trying to wear these masks mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, transparency. It doesn't mean that you have to share every single little thought that comes into your head. I mean, I, that would be a little too much. But I think transparency is good because we're not all perfect. We go through shit. You know, mm-hmm. there's struggles in marriages, there's struggles being a parent, you know, some parents, some people love it, some people don't like being parents. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, being able to admit these things to ourselves is the only way that we're going to start having some sort of healing dialogue between yeah. ourselves and each other. And I think the hardest thing, because we're all so different, and for me personally, you know, you said that you love freedom. That's how I am too. Like, I want to get up and I want to travel the world I cannot live in the same place. Like everyone makes fun of me, my family, because I move so much because I don't, I don't like static energy. Like I just like to move and experience different parts of the world. And, you know, that's the hardest part. um, Going back to what you first asked me at the beginning of the interview about being a parent and about being married is you can't just get up and go. And that's how my energy is. I love to travel. I love to just experience life with people. Yeah. So, yeah. so my personality, a lot of people, you know, m- my husband's Mexican. So the dynamic of men in his family say, oh, Monica, she's too outgoing. She's too flirtatious. She's too strong. Um, she, I love everybody, but how it can look if I'm looking, if I'm talking to a guy, it can look like I'm coming on to him. No, I'm going to talk to you probably the same way I'm going to talk to him, but I just, I love people. You know, and thankfully, I think the main reason that we have still, my husband and I are still together is he's not insecure. He know he understands my soul. You know, he understands that, hey, yeah, I might take a selfie on Instagram and it might be fitness and whatever. The average man will get really insecure about that and say, you can't take a picture in a sports bra and your workout clothes. That's too much. And then if I go out, if I go to the club with my husband, I will talk to everybody. You know what I'm saying? I might even dance with that guy, you know, whatever his name over there. My husband will be right there. I'm not trying to be sly about it. I think that's for us what keeps that element of spontaneity, spiciness. You know, (laughs) it's like we got married so young, we have to keep it fun. And having an element of competition for us works. It might not work for everybody. There's a lot of people who are far too insecure to be like, yeah, go ahead and go dance with that guy. You know, I can't. A lot of men can't take that. No, and security I personally is a big like, thing. Yeah, I personally like it when he says, when he shows me a picture of a celebrity who he likes. I like that because it makes me remember, I got to stay on my stuff. I can't get too complacent, you know? And I think that's why it's important for moms, if you're married, if you're dating, you know, it's so important to feel good about who you are. And if that means taking care of your body, you don't have to be a size three, but just taking care of yourself and feeling good and being okay, being being comfortable, feeling sexy. 
own your goddess. You know, I'm all for owning your goddess. And I think that our marriage is just so much more fun when he allows me to be a goddess. And he doesn't like feel like he's like that. Because if he was like that, Stephanie, I wouldn't still be here. Because yeah. my spirit, my spirit is too free. I love everybody. So if you feel like you're like this, we're going to have a problem. So he so gives me space. That's a hard one, especially with your personality, because we're, we're very similar. I'm the same way. I love people. And, you know, the more I've gotten to know myself, like, and especially working in the industry that I worked in before in the liquor, I'm used to going to parties, socializing. So it's really hard because you have to be careful because not every guy is comfortable with that. You know, oh, you know, you're talking to this guy or you're being too... And I'm a very free person. My my first, my ex, my first boyfriend years back, six, seven years ago, you know, he was always like, you know, Stephanie, you just like change too much. Like, don't you ever just want to settle? And I want to settle, but I like change and I'm always going to like it. Like, I like freedom and it's like the air you breathe. I, you know, I need freedom as much as I need air. <laughs> but I think it's, I just, it's hard it in a relationship just a different topic but I think you're going to be a great mom like I'm excited for you to be a mom and I hope that we can interview each other again once you are a mom because I feel like it's going to make you oh, it just changes you but for the better I'm much more confident now that I'm a mom and you already you're already exuding confidence and authenticity so you're going to be a step of a step ahead of the majority of people who have children unconsciously unfortunately you know so I think I, I, it doesn't seem like you fear being a mother, but I, I definitely think that you shouldn't in any way because I just, I sense that you're just going to be a great mom and your kids are probably going to want to travel the world with you. You know? <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I look, I look forward to the day that that happens. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely something to, to experience. Um, but we'll, we'll see when that happens. Um, yeah, but it's good. No, because you said that you know that being a mother is a part of your plan. And I think that is one of the most, I think Elizabeth Gilbert, the author of Eat, Pray, Love, she said that's one of the most important decisions that a woman can make in her life is knowing whether she's the auntie, the fun auntie with no kids, or whether she's the mom, whether she's the mom who still has dreams and ambitions. Like knowing who you are as a woman mm -hmm. and whether or not you want to procreate is a big part of your plan. You know, so the fact that, you know, is I think you're already a step ahead because a lot of people are like, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Or, and, or they just think that it's the next step. You know, you're married and it's just the next step to take. Do you have um, any final words to share with our viewers before we um, wrap it up? Uh, yes, um, <laughs> of course. Uh, I think, first of all, thank you so much because I really admire what you do. I admire who you are. And I respect the woman that you are. And, you know, I, I, I called out in the universe to attract more energies. And, and then you came back into my life. So thank you. Um, and I just want to tell everyone to not be afraid to walk your own path, to forge your own path. And don't compare your life to anyone else's because that's only going to leave you more confused. You really, really, really have to kind of unplug. And, and turn off the TV and turn off the phone and just really get in touch with who you are so that you know what footsteps you need to make in your path because it's the most important thing that you can do is live on purpose. So that's for male, female, moms, non-moms. That's for everybody. You know, know who you are, own it, and walk forward with your path and confidence. I love it. Live on purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Monica, thank you. I'm going to have a link for your website and your book. And I look forward to connecting with you. So thank you so much for being on Candid Conversation. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to, to watch it, even though it's always hard to watch yourself. But I still, I'm excited. <laughs> I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> Stephanie.